Hi, I'm Carl Franklin. In this episode of Blazor Train, I'll show you the basics of input validation. But first, I'd like to welcome you to this first episode of 2021. You know, last year we published our first 31 episodes, covering most of the topics that I've set out to cover. But there's more coming. This year I'll focus on solutions. I'll show you snippets of code that I've developed for real customers in Blazor. Another thing I want to do this year is take your calls, your screen share video conference calls. Yeah, I want to help you develop your solutions in Blazor. Maybe you need help integrating App State into your application. Maybe you need help debugging a real head scratcher. Well, if you're willing to show the world your code, contact me here at carl at appvnext.com and we'll make it happen. Uh, and of course, whenever there are new features of Blazor, I'll be there to cover them. Okay, now let's talk about input validation right now, right here on Blazor Train. So here I have a very simple Blazor server .NET 5 application called validation. I haven't done anything to it. So let's start at the beginning. Uh, we're going to add a model. We're going to add some properties to that model and some rules, some annotations, and then we'll create an edit form and I'll show you how you can enforce those rules. Um, well, let Blazor enforce the rules without doing a whole lot of work yourself. So let's add a models folder. And to that, we're going to add a class called customer. So this is just a regular class. We've got a public name string property. Um, but you also notice we have some data annotations here. And these are made possible by this using statement, system component model data annotations. And we're saying to the system that this is a required field and the maximum length is 20. We even have this little error message, a custom error message that says the name can only be 20 characters. So that's where we're going to start. Um, before we can do any UI, of course, I'm going to add this using statement to my imports razor file. So now I can hijack the index page, which is something I want to do. I've got a button up at the top that calls this show edit form method. When I click on it, and you can notice I have this Boolean if edit form visible, then I'm going to show my form. So here's my show edit form. I've got a UI message, which I've set to nothing that goes in a div or an empty string. I got my Boolean edit form visible equals false. I've got a new customer called selected customer. And I create a new one anyway, when I call show edit form, and then I set edit form visible to true. So when that renders now, this is going to be true and all of this will now render. So I've just got a couple of divs, you know, one inside another, uh, just to show that this is sort of an editor, you know, that it's separate from the main page, whatever. This is just UI candy. You don't have to worry about that. But this is the real guy right here. Edit form. Edit form is a built-in component in Blazor that does data annotation. And there's a couple other things that you need. You need this data annotations validator right there because this says, hey, we're going to use for validation, we're going to use the data annotations that are built into the class as well. Now you can build your own custom validators, but that's outside the scope of this video. Maybe I'll do that on another Blazor train. So this is basically saying we're going to look at those annotations and get the rules from there. All right. Now, when I click the submit button, which is right here, it's a submit button. I'm not going to allow it to go through to submit button pressed unless all of the rules pass, unless the data passes the rules, right? So submit button pressed, all I'm doing is I'm saying UI message equals customer submitted. And I also have a cancel button pressed that says cancel button was pressed. So you obviously do what you need to do right here. This is not the point. Now look at this, the cancel button. I had to set it to type equals button. Otherwise, Blazor would consider this another submit button. So if you omit this, 
you're essentially getting two submit buttons and no cancel button. Now let's get to the meat of it, input text. So this is uh, wrapping the DOM input element um, where the type is text, but with validation support. So we're saying, by the way, now we can bind the value of input text to the selected customer name property. And that's really all we have to do. Now, how do we show those messages? Well, that's what this is for, a validation summary. And so all the messages get displayed right there when they, when they show up. Now, if you want to, and we'll do this later, you can have individual messages that are based on those particular uh, fields so that we can place them appropriately where they need to go. The only other thing that I haven't talked about here is the model. And so this is basically saying the selected customer is the class or the object, the class of which is the model for this edit form, has all the data annotations. So it's going to look in the annotations for this object class uh, customer to get all those rules. All right. So really, that's all we have. So let's give it a give it a go here and see what happens. All right. So I'm going to click edit customer. And I'm just going to type in a name, Carl, and submit, and everything's cool. Now I'm going to violate the rule. Carl Franklin the Third Esquire, maybe. And when I tab off of it, it triggers that uh, update, and the name can only be 20 characters is displayed right there. So it's not letting me submit. In fact, the last thing it says was cancel button press. So I'm just going to do the whole thing again and do a blotty, 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 blah, tab off of it and submit doesn't do anything. It sort of short gets short circuited because the rule is uh, violated. So of course I can cancel. Now let's move on to the next step. And the next step is I want this to validate on every keystroke. Well, you remember I showed you how to do that, right? All right, but that doesn't work with the input text. So there's a way to do this. It's a little bit tricky. But you essentially have to subclass input text and then go down a level to the input and add your um, uh, bind event there. So we're going to actually create a new component over here in the shared folder called instant input text. So we're inheriting the input text control component. And then we have our input and we specify that we have additional attributes and we're binding the current value as string. And there's that bind event on input right there. So you have to do this. You can't just use this little th phrase on an input text. Well, now it's pretty easy to modify. We just change this from input text to instant input text and rerun it. And now as I type my big long blobby blah string, there we go. I didn't have to tab off of it. I didn't have to lose focus. It automatically uh, did the validation on every keystroke. And I think that's really important. So that's a very simple rule, maximum length. What about some other rules? What are some other annotations we can add to customer? Well, how about this? So here's an email property that's string. And we can actually say, hey, you know what? This is an email address. So it's going to validate as an email address. Very cool. Now we can go back here and add email, also using instant input text. Now we'll change that to email. And away we go. All right, we can do that. And we can also just start typing something that isn't an email address. But as soon as we add an at sign and something else, now it becomes valid. Okay. Now I'm going to show you a little JavaScript hack that has saved my butt many, many times. And it has to do with focus. Now I know that there is a focus method now in the DOM elements, all right, that you can use to make a call into that. 
but it doesn't go all the way to instant input text. So you, first of all, you can't use that with this, but I will sh I'll show you how we would do it if this was just a regular old input. We would get an element reference name input, and by the way, that has to be a lowercase v. And here I would say at ref equals name input, all right? So now when I call show edit form, I want to say name input focus async. And now because that's async, I have to set this to async, and I have to await that. All right, so let's see what happens here. Oh, an exception happened. And I'll just save you the trouble of going through the debugging. Here's the problem. When you call focus async on this, this name input doesn't yet exist, right? So even if we could do this with instant input text, it wouldn't work. It doesn't exist because it hasn't rendered yet. So we basically have to call a JavaScript method that can wait until it gets a reference. And if it doesn't get a reference, just keep trying until it gets a reference, right? Until that rendering happens. Now, yeah, I could probably try to, and I have tried this, try to cajole the um, lifecycle method for uh, on after render async right and see if it's the first render and if it is then i can call focus on that thing but now i only want to do it once you know i only want to do it on the yes on the first render but if i refresh the page and it renders again i don't want it to have i don't want it to go back to the first one it literally only happens once when i say i want to edit this form i want to show the form and i want to set the focus into that name property so let me revert this back to the way it was a second ago. And now let's add some JavaScript to our underscore host CSHTML file. And I'll explain the magic. Here's where it is, folks. So window.setFocus, this is what I'm going to call from C Sharp. We pass the ID, so we're going to have to give that element, that instant input text element, an ID. No problem there. Then I'm waiting for 10 milliseconds and I'm calling this internal focus function, passing the ID. I'm going to try to get the element reference, but if it's null, I'm going to wait 10 milliseconds again and call myself again. And I'm going to keep doing that until I get a reference. And uh, then I'm going to call focus and I'm going to call select. Turns out it only has to do this a couple of times. How many? I don't know, but I don't care. It's going to find it sooner or later, as long as I call it in the right place. So let's go back to index razor here, and we'll just, we'll just do this manually here. I think I have a version of this, but we need to inject ijs runtime, js runtime. So we need access to the JavaScript runtime. Now when we come down here to show edit form, yep, we need this to be async as well because the JavaScript call is asynchronous. And here we'll say await JS runtime invoke void async. Set focus. And then the ID, which we haven't set it yet, but we will set it to customer.name. Now let's take customer name and we'll make that the ID of this guy. So now when we press that button and we edit the customer, now you can see name has a blinking carrot. What? You don't see it? Okay, well now you see it, right? Now I said I would show you how to do the uh, validation messages right at the field rather than a validation summary. Well, let me show you what that looks like. There it is. So we still have the data annotations validator here, but instead of having a validation summary here, we've got validation messages for each of the properties right next to those instant input text fields.
All right, name, blah 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 Can only be 20 characters, yada yada. Not a valid email address. Now it is. All right. Okay, now before I let you go, I want to show you a few more things that you can add uh, annotation-wise to help you validate. Just Let's just kick it up a notch. Okay, so there's our name and our email. Here's an integer rating, and we can pass a range. F lowest number, highest number, and then an error message. How about a date, a date time? Now, we don't have anything here but required, but I can show you how the validator works with dates. Phone for phone numbers. There's some really cool stuff here. And also I have this required string time zone, which we're going to bind to with a select or an input select. So let's go take a look at our new index that accesses all of these things. Okay, and here we go. Here's our rating. It's an input number control. Uh, everything else is exactly the same instead of instant input text we're using input number. Here's an input date. Same deal. Now here's a phone that we are using an instant input text for, but because it has that phone number attribute, it's going to be validated against what is and what makes up a valid phone number. Now this is cool. You have an input select, which is a select or a drop down list or whatever, but we're binding the value directly to an object. In this case, it's the time zone property of selected customer. And it's a time zone in the US, so it's going to be Eastern, Central, Mountain, or Pacific. So let's go through all these and see what they see what violating the rules looks like. Okay. We know the name, we know the email. Now here's our rating. Interestingly, if I say like negative one and I move off it, it's going to tell me must be between one and 10. 11, nope, no good. Two, happy with that. Now here's a date. And uh, what I did was I set it up to be uh, 20,000 days in the past. So for me, for right now, it lands on April 1966. And if you do something like press a zero in here for the year, it says the date of birth field must be a date. All right, now the phone is really interesting. I can't do letters, random letters. That's a good one. I can do parentheses. So like 800, 444, yada, 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 yada. Now if I do, let's say I want an extension, right? Get this, I type EXT and I'm like, oh, it's not gonna let me put in any extension. But then if I do like a number after that, hmm, okay, that's cool. It also has a shorthand, X, and that works as well. But you can't do any letter, you know? You can't do A or, or B, 12, whatever, only X for extension, or EXT also works. So that's pretty cool. Like it's, it's smart enough to know that sometimes people need to specify an extension. And here's our time zone. So we've selected one, and I think we made this a required field. So if we set it from something back to select time zone, it's gonna yell at us and not allow us to submit. And there you have it, validation. Back to you in the studio, Carl. You know, 2021 is going to be a great year, even compared to years other than 2020. .NET 6 will be mind-blowing, and we're all looking forward to that in November. But besides the technology itself, I personally can't wait to get back on the road teaching Blazor workshops and seeing all of your smiling faces in person again. Keep the faith. Hey, thanks for riding the rails with me today. This is where I jump off. I'll see you next time. Blaze a train!